While previously we were talking about embedded systems, it's now time to shift our gears a little bit over to the machine learning side of things. Just the way an embedded system had both the hardware and software perspectives were both severely challenged. On a machine learning side, there are increasing trends that we are observing in the size, the complexity and power requirements that make it quite challenging to unlock the power of tiny ML. But again, that's not a challenge that we can't overcome. It's more of being able to think critically about what we need to do in order to get there to enable TinyML. So let me start off by talking about what are some of the interesting trends that we've been seeing in machine learning and where it's going. Machine learning, think of it as a box. And for now, think of it as how big or how small that box is. So what I'm showing you on the x-axis over time are effectively the state-of-the-art models, machine learning models specific to natural language processing or NLP, and how big they have been getting over the recent years. On the y-axis, we have what we call the number of parameters of the model. Don't worry about what parameters mean. We will cover that much more in the course. Now, what we are seeing on the x-axis is time, and what we are seeing is that as time is going by, the complexity of these models is increasing steadily. Now, if you look at the most recent model, which is called the GPT-3 from OpenAI, you will see that it's remarkably complicated as compared to all the other ones that were down there. So now don't let the scale fool you. The model is so big and this box is so big that the rest of them look quite small. In fact, just a few months or a few years ago, those models looked like they were the biggest differences in terms of their sizes. The key point I'm trying to get across is that machine learning models are growing fast in complexity. And moreover, in order to be able to keep up with them, the computing capability that is needed is growing remarkably fast. So for instance, from 2012, when the boom of machine learning really came about thanks to AlexNet and the use of big GPUs, over the recent few years that we have seen this remarkable escalation in terms of computing capability needed to be able to get those models out there. So for instance, between 2012 and roughly where we are now, the computing needs have grown by 300,000 times. That's 300,000 times. That's an astounding amount of computational horsepower increase. So at the same time, they were able to provide these black box machine models to be able to provide these incredible capabilities. Well, that said, they also require tons and tons of compute power. So now if we go still further back before AlexNet in 2012, all the way back to the original source of history of for machine learning back to the 1960s, when all this stuff was just coming out, you'll see that back in 60s, say maybe to about maybe 2010, there was roughly a steady linear kind of pace and then once we got in the recent years, there's been this remarkable steep increase in terms of computational capability requirements. What is that saying? That our interest in machine learning has grown so much that we are spending so many cycles, you know, that, that the space of innovation needed to unlocking this power is just quite remarkable. Therefore, companies like Google have been building custom solutions, custom processors, just the way that you have an Intel or an AMD processor in your laptop and are able to do general purpose computing, companies like Google have been building custom processors to run just this one task, this machine learning task, and they've been called TPUs or tensor processing units or cloud TPUs because they actually live in the cloud, not literally in the cloud, but in big data centers that are remotely accessible to us. And if you look at these cloud TPUs, oh, they look like big skyscrapers that are physically about you know, this much. And the heat sink on them is about this tall, right? And, the, and that's just to keep the processor cool because it has to take out so much heat because the computing is so intensive. So what are companies doing? They're taking all these processors, jam packing them into these big racks. And then there are multiple cloud TPUs all packed in row after row, column after column, right next to each other. So that all these things are being sandwiched into big data centers that are about the size of a football field. And they consume so much power, they actually have to be physically put right next to the sources where there's water, for example, like this picture of a Google data center in Netherlands. 
you're seeing that it's actually right next to renewable energy because it costs a lot of money to power these things. Well, there's a lot of interest in this, and there's also a lot of interest in the capabilities of TinyML because that's where the data lives. So how have things been evolving in generally in machine learning? What this plot is specifically showing is on the x-axis, the amount of computational power needed, how many multiplies and accumulates and, and uh, different computation processes are needed and so forth are needed to do all the arithmetic. And on the y-axis is the accuracy or how accurate, accurately is it saying it's a dog or a cat. And the size of the circle is telling me how big or how lean or skinny the model is, right? So, so there are three pieces of information on the chart. And now what I want to do is walk you through a little bit on the critical evolution and then set the stage as to where things need to go. So the first and foremost model that people refer to is AlexNet, which happened in 2012. It's basically trying to predict a thousand classes from the ImageNet data set. We'll talk about these things in more greater detail, but the key thing here is that it was able to get an accuracy of say 51, 57.1%. And this model size was 61 megabytes in size. Then we wanted better accuracy. So we we want to be able to say a cat is a cat, a dog is a dog. And we want to be able to do this with better accuracy, more than something that's 50 something percent, right? So VGG Net came along in 2014 as an example, and that boosted the accuracy to 71.5%. But look at the size of that circle, right? What happened? We went from something that was smaller in order of 60 megabytes to something that's almost 10 times as big as 528 megabytes. That's enormous for a size of a model, you know, one jump, right? So, well, we realized we can't keep making things bigger. So we tried to make them a bit more efficient while also improving accuracy. So in 2015, Microsoft released ResNet or residual networks. And this particular network improved the accuracy to 75.8% while shrinking the model size as it was getting better. So we're doing great. We are starting to improve the machine learning models in order to make them both accurate and also more cognizant about the size. Then as smartphones uh, became very prevalent for machine learning deployments, that's when a major shift happened and we saw the evolution move towards mobile nets. With mobile nets, we were saying that, well, no, size is extremely critical. We need to optimize for that. We can't just think about accuracy. We have to make this thing small because it has to fit on your phone. So what did we do? We compromised on accuracy, but we dramatically shrunk the size of the network. We made it only 16.9 megabytes. What I'm trying to get across to you here is that if you look at these couple of milestone markers that I've cherry picked for you, what I'm trying to say is that in our pursuit for better accuracy, better understanding of the data, we are being given and being able to see that a cat is a cat or a dog is a dog so correctly, we've been pushing ourselves naively to making things bigger and bigger. But slowly we understood that resource constraints of computing systems that we cannot keep making things bigger. Since then, there have been other networks, but the critical point is that the networks that we have today, they are still pretty, pretty big. And there's, it's, for example, there's 17 megabytes or maybe even a handful of megabytes, it doesn't matter. The key nugget is that our little embedded microcontrollers you know, only have a few kilobytes of memory, a few kilobytes. That's an order of magnitude difference between where the usual state of the art sits and how we need to cram things into that microcontroller. What we will learn next is about a whole slew of techniques to compress large models to fit into tiny hardware. 